Okay, welcome back, Joint Ops fans. Jimmy Vrien with Joint Ops Properties and Ryan Lee with Atlas Wealth. Coming back to finish up our Jim Harbaugh case study. We got such positive feedback when we put the video out the first time, probably because I put it on it out on a football Friday. <laughs> but it seemed, to, uh, it, get, it seemed to get a lot of views, so we're going to go through the X's and O's of the policy. And you might be asking yourself, this is a real estate YouTube channel. Why do I keep seeing life insurance videos. And the reason you keep seeing life insurance videos is we're just trying to make the point that if you are going to invest in real estate, you do want to start with a whole life policy first to maximize your return and use a better banking system. Okay, you got so let's it. get started, right? Cool. All right. So let's, we're going to go. And also gonna... it's my YouTube channel, so I get to talk about whatever I want to. That's the good thing about having your own YouTube channel, right? Right. So let's talk about Jim Harbaugh's policy specifically, and then we'll go in and um, you know we'll, we'll look at the numbers. Now, how they how they designed Jim Harbaugh's policy is, is you know anyone's guess. I kind of took a stab at it just so we can see why Jim Harbaugh and the University of Michigan would do something like this. This is how you would have designed it. Yeah. Yes. You were so Jim, he was getting four million dollars up front, right? And while you're watching this, in the back of your mind, be thinking, why wouldn't he just take this money as W-2 income? Yeah. Well, that, that's, that's a good point right there. I mean, let, let's just blow that apart really quick. So I'm going to pull up a calculator here. <laughs> uh, this is Truth Concepts. Uh, it, it, this is a fantastic calculator to find the truth of anything out there. So all I'm going to do, I'm going to pull up, this is how our U.S. You know, tax system works. Right? So Mary, I think Jim's married, right? So... Let's say, what do we say, $4 million? Let's say he's getting $4 million. The way the tax code works is we get taxed on the, the highest dollar that we earn. In fact, let's, do, let's take it a little bit lower just for the discussion here. If you're earning $20,000, the first $18,000 that you make, you're taxed at 10%. The next $55,000 that you make, you're taxed at 15%. The next 75 that you make, you're taxed at 25. The next 51 you make, you're taxed at 28. And it just simply progresses up and up from there. Today, the, the highest tax bracket you can be in, and this is just federal, this does not include state, but you can pay up to 39.6% in taxes. So if we think about this from Jim's standpoint, we need to add another zero on here. Jim's making $2 million, or what do we say, $4 million. We'll, we'll just keep it $2 million for this. $1.5 million of the two will be taxed at 40%, meaning his total tax bill in this whole situation, $738,000 of two million is taxable. Gone, right off the top. Right. So you think that's enough of his fair share? Yeah, well, yeah, we'll see, huh? And it depends on who you ask if you watched the debates last, last night. <laughs> yeah. So the way Paul his policy was was said to be designed is they were gonna put four million dollars towards the policy up front. And then from year from the next after that they were gonna do two million dollars a year for five years. So again, what all we want to do is we want to figure out the right number and we want to make this number the ideal number to keep our cost of insurance as low as possible. So with the policy, so let's. And what would have been the tax liability on those dollars? Mm, that would have been crazy. I mean, I guess it, it, if we just go back to this seven hundred and thirty-eight thousand. And this is assuming, you know, this is assuming no tax deductions. I'm sure there's other ways that they could pay this out, but 738,000 times seven of these, uh, would we, is that right? So yeah, five million. So five million of the 14 will be taxable. And what's the total percentage of, that's a close to a third, right? Yeah, easily. Okay, so by doing these policy, he just keeps five million bucks. And more important, I mean, not more important, but just as importantly as that, because it's life insurance, I mean, think about this. If we look at the tax code, there's really only two places that most people think of where to put our money. So let, let's just think of the tax code as a, as a bucket system, right? You can put your money in the taxable bucket, which means you pay taxes on that money as it's earned today. So think about if you have any money in a brokerage account, a CD or anything like that, every year you get a statement to say, hey, you earn X amount of dollars and you have to pay a percentage of that in taxes. Okay. You can put your money in a tax deferred account and this is what most people choose to do for retirement. They say, okay, I'm gonna put money in. Your CPA, who you hire to save you taxes today, says it's a good thing to do because he can come back and say, look, 
you earned X amount of dollars, you put in 20K into the tax deferred bucket and you get to take a deduction on that. But now what we're doing is we're taking this entire 20K and all of the interest that you earn on this it. This wouldn't work for Harbaugh because there's limits to how much you can defer. Yeah, limits to how much you can defer. But even for the average person, even you know the average person, a high income earner, if we think about the purpose of saving, the purpose for all fundamental saving is one day we want to turn it into a stream of income. Why on earth would we shift our biggest liability, taxes, to the future when we need the income the most? So the last bucket. When you're wealthier, when you're older. You got it. Well, that I mean, if you've got a CPA who's telling you that you're going to retire poorer than you are now, then you should fire him and get the right CPA. Right. I mean, sign up with Atlas Wealth. You got it, Atlas Wealth, man. I mean, if you're if you're uh. You know, if your CPA tells you you're going to retire in a lower tax bracket, all he really is telling you is you're going to retire poorer than you are today. And that's a really, to me, that's always been a depressing image. That is, man. I mean, what's retirement all about? It's not about living on top ramen. It's about traveling, seeing your grandkids, golfing, doing all the things that you might not have done during your working years. Right. But here's, here's the interesting thing. If we look at the tax-free buckets, you know, there are literally only three things that fit in the tax-free bucket. If you truly want tax-free growth on your money, you can use municipal bonds, right, munis. You can use a Roth IRA, which isn't really available to, to high-income earners. But these two, these are really controlled by the government, right? Municipal bonds are government bonds. Roth IRA is a qualified plan. The third option and the only option where you have unlimited opportunity is life insurance. So that's why if we look at large corporations, if we look at higher income earning executives like Jim Harbaugh, why on earth are they using life insurance? They're playing the tax game. They're using the tools, they're using the tax code as a way to show them what to do to get maximum efficiency of their dollars. Okay, so hey, let's go to the numbers and let's look at how this thing would turn out. So I, I googled Jim Harbaugh's age. Jim Harbaugh's 52. So I set up a policy on, on, on Jim Harbaugh here he looks like he's in pretty good shape. He's a football player, and every time you see him out, out, you know, before the football games, he's out pounding his his quarterback and you know yelling at him and running up and down the sideline. So I'm gonna assume he's in preferred health. All that means is we're gonna get the associated death benefit that we need for cheaper dollars. If he's in less than ideal health, then it, it costs a little bit more to get the death benefit. So remember, we're gonna get four million in within six months. So these first two premiums are from the four million dollars, and then these last five premiums are the two million that the University of Michigan will put in every year thereafter, okay? So a total of $14 million going into this policy. And what you'll notice here, this is kind of the cool thing, he puts in $2 million and right away he has $1.5 million in cash value. $1.5 million in cash value. Now, there's some restrictions in this cash value. In this case, the way it's set up, the University of Michigan is kind of collateralizing that cash value just in right. case he, he quits or, or, or his contract is terminated. So he can't technically use that. But Jimmy, what did you do with your policy the second you had it set up? Pulled the money out and bought a, and bought a house. Bingo. So for the Technically, average, there's still a million and a half on his balance sheet. Yeah. So he was a real estate investor, he could go to a bank and use that million and a half as collateral. You got it. You got it. So we won't go into all the things you can do with this, but yeah, man, he could use this for real estate. He could use this to fund a business. He could use it to fund family travel, buy a second home, whatever he wants to use it for. Uh, this money is also earning an interest rate and a dividend. So effectively, this is doing two things at the same time. We're not going to go into the mechanics of policy loans, but you can quite literally have your money doing two things at the same time. Now, it's easy to see there's a cost of insurance. $2 million goes in, 1.5 comes out. If Jim Harbaugh were to get hit by a bus tomorrow, he, the University of Michigan and his family would receive, you know, however they split up the death benefit, they would have a $39 million death benefit. Now, looking at it from the, from the, the surface, we might be thinking, man, that's crazy. That's a lot of death benefit for the cash value. We'll look at this big picture. This is the minimum amount of death benefit we need for the way this policy is designed, big picture. So we'll come back to how we cash value. Math, is. And it would not be tax free. Yeah, you got it. Okay, so, so when here, I buy my policies, the death benefits are great and it is an added peace of mind, but I'm really buying them for the banking system that I can use. 
I want to get into that tax-free banking system, just like the banks are, just like high net worth individuals are. Got it. You got it. So that's the whole goal. I mean, it has to be your policy has to be designed to do that. And here's how we start to see the design coming through in year two when or with the second premium. So again, four million going in. So six months from now, the second two million goes into the policy, and the cash value goes from one point five to three point three. So at this time, it jumps up by $1.8 million. So the majority of what just went into the policy now shows up in cash value. And so it's a 200 k cost of insurance year two. You got it. And this is the cool part. When a policy is designed this way, it's usually the third premium is kind of our magic year. So in year three, when two or with premium three, when $2 million goes into the policy, cash value goes from 3.3 to 5.4. And what we can see right there is everything, his cash value just went up by 2.1 million. So now he's got a life insurance policy. He literally has a bank where every new dollar that's going into the policy is immediately being reflected in cash value. And he still has the $39.9 million death benefit. And he's still collecting a dividend off all those dollars in the cash value. You got it. You that's got free. It. So in the fifth premium, right? they would have put in $10 million total into this policy. He now has $10 million of cash value. So from a cash value standpoint, he's break even, right? They put in 10, they have 10 million in cash value, but they also have a $40 million death benefits. So in this example, we got two more premiums being funded. And then what we do is we actually close the policy. So, a lot so of by year seven, that's a million and a half dollars in dividends and interest. You got it. Yeah, you got it. Free. And that, that's the cool part. I mean, a lot of people think about, man, if I open up a whole life policy, I got to put money into it for the rest of my life. And you can do that. And there's very good benefits for doing that. But after the seventh premium, we, we close this policy, which means nothing ever has to go into the policy again. And you'll notice what happens is when we close it, the death benefit takes a slight, a slight hit. And we're not going to go into all the mechanics of why that is, but the death benefit drops from 43 million down to 34 million. So that 34 million is literally a paid up, completely funded death benefit. They, he never has to put another dollar into the policy to get that death benefit. But as you mentioned, Jimmy, he's got $16 million of cash value now. And that cash value continues to grow every single year. It looks and like he gets about a million and a half in dividends and interest every year, tax free. You, you got it. Now, the, the article wasn't specific about, you know, was University of Michigan charging an interest rate on this loan? And if they were charging an interest rate, who was paying for that and all of that? So just to keep the, the analogy simple, University of Michigan loaned or gave Jim Harbaugh $14 million. And they're using it to fund a life insurance policy. So what I'm going to show doing is... Well, this is a guaranteed annuity for them as well. Bingo. They know they're getting their money back. Whether Jim dies or, or he doesn't die and he lives... They've got enough in the cash value or they have enough in the death benefit. It's guaranteed 100% backed. Let's go up here to the top really quick. Backed by a company who has done this every single year since 1847 all the way to today. Never right. filled on a contract. But imagine if they had just paid that in salary to Harbaugh too. They would have lost all that money. Yeah. And a good third of it would have gone to the government. So neither party would have benefited. Yep. Neither party wins there. Um, so in this example, I'm going to show in year 15, and, and again, you, the exact mechanics, but just so you can see how this one works. In year 14, I'm going to show us taking a distribution. So taking $14 million back. So the original 14 that went in, we're pulling it back out. So you'll notice the cash value drops from 23 down to $10 million. The death benefit drops from 42 down to 17. So now the University of Michigan has all of the money that He's they put in. He's not going to pay taxes on that $14 million still, right? Zero taxes. Nice. But now the University of Michigan, they got the services that they wanted from Jim Harbaugh. So they're exchanging money for services. So they got their man. They got their services. They're, what are they ranked right now? Number four in the country. They're, they're getting a return on their investment. Um, they get all their money back, right? Guaranteed. So it's protected, guaranteed. But what does Jim Harbaugh get out of this whole thing? Jim Harbaugh now at age 67, he's got $10 million of cash value. Now remember that $10 million, this is tax free. He's put it in the tax free bucket. So that $10 million is his to use 100% and he has a paid up death benefit of $17 million. 
So there's a whole and bunch he, of different ideas we could go into here. But man, right? Actually, he doesn't have to give that money back. No, no, and yeah, that's the way they put in the article. He doesn't because. University of Michigan knows they're going to get the money back anyway. I, I could have put up another illustration and say, what if we took Jim Harbaugh to life expectancy? At life expectancy, the death benefit's going to be whatever, astronomical. And when, death, right. when, when Jim dies, they could say, okay, that death benefit plus the associated interest rate with the money we put in, we're going to take that. Jim, you and your family get the rest. Pretty nice. Pretty cool, huh? So, man, and that's... What if there was a massive revolt of all employees wanting to be paid this way? <laughs> well, what, what, what's the book Carlos Lara wrote? What is that book where they talk about the 10% rule? To, t to top the fractional reserve uh, system, the banking system, it would take 10% of the population to start acting this way. So, right. man, it would, it would tumble, crumble the system that's, that's really designed to enslave the average American. Right, the banking system enslaves us. It literally enslaves us. We think every Michigan fan started getting paid this way. There's your ten percent right there. Yeah. Yep. So, as a plug to Nelson Nash, if anyone watching this wants more more information, read Nelson Nash's book. I think that's the first book you guys read uh, when you first learned about this. He right. calls this strategy infinite banking concept, and it's quite simple, man. Once you understand the principles of banking and you understand some basic personal economics, the practical use of this strategy is infinite. I mean, Jim could use this for anything under the sun. You're using it for real estate. I've used it for real estate, for starting a business. Man, I paid for a, a heart surgery, a, an unexpected emergency heart surgery using my policy one time. It's a reservoir of capital that you control that is outside of the government's hands. It's a private contract between you, a private individual, and a private insurance company. It's quite literally an infinite opportunity and possibility. Right. It is what banks are supposed to do is be a safe place to store your capital. Because of bail-ins, because of a lot of other reasons, they don't do that anymore. So this is is going to have to take over the banking function for average Americans. So when I look at it, the death benefit's great. I just have a better banking system now. It's one that you control. When you took your policy loan, did did the insurance company ask you any questions at all? Nope. Did it affect your debt to income ratio when you went down to the bank and tried to get a typical loan? Nope. And it's still on my balance sheet as liquid cash. You got it. It's a pretty amazing concept, man. I love it. That's why we keep doing these videos, even though this is a real estate YouTube channel. All right, well, if this doesn't convince you it's a better banking system, and go out to your boss tomorrow and ask to get paid this way. <laughs> and talk to you later. Bye. See you guys.